Okay, chat, okay, guys, a little bit of discretion is advised, okay? Uh, like I always say when I watch these videos. I, I, I know it might seem like I'm, like I'm, I'm too, I'm being kind of a pussy about, about this, but um, I, I, I think it's important to do it, so I, I still do it. I've enjoyed those videos, but these uh, present uh, 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 the disgusting, evil uh, uh, people that that did really bad things, uh, regardless, and um, they they show the mind of uh, of of killers and whatnot, and they present a dark concept that you might not want to uh, know about. So before it happens, I'm telling you ahead of time. Skip the whole the full, whole four minutes. Okay, we'll just go from three thirty. To 420 and then we're gonna skip the whole thing. In the year 1980, on Wednesday the 9th of July at exactly 11.54 p.m., a little girl named Jody Ann Arias was born in the city of Salinas, California, and completely unbeknownst to her doting parents, was destined to become one of the most infamous people in the United States of America. From what we know about her behavioral sequences, and despite what her defense team would later want you to believe, there's virtually nothing in Jody's childhood that can be linked as a contributing factor to what she would eventually be capable of. The only thing worth mentioning was that she dropped out of high school in the 11th grade to pursue a career in photography, but it went nowhere, it. so she began working at a hotel restaurant which became her occupation for the next eight years. In February of 2006, at 26 years of age, she began a new job as a salesperson for a network marketing company called Prepaid Legal, and it was through this occupation where she crossed paths with fellow sales representative Travis Alexander, a 28-year-old practicing Mormon from Arizona who also worked part-time as a motivational speaker. When you get someone to the briefing, they say no, that counts. When you get someone fully exposed and they say no, that counts. Every time you get one of those, cross one off the list. By the time the hundredth one's crossed off the list, you won't be able to spend the money. He was a very charismatic young man, which immediately caught Jody's attention. Okay. They met at a business conference in September of 2006 and began a curious relationship from that point forward. To cut a long story short, Jody was in love, and Travis was not. They broke up after just five months, but soon after the split, Jody moved from her grandparents' home in Wairica, California, into an apartment just two blocks from Travis's house in Jeez. Mesa, Arizona. She was at that moment labeled the crazy stalker ex by all of Travis's friends. And although Travis agreed, he would continue having sex with her out of pure convenience. She would show up unannounced on countless occasions, sometimes in the middle of the night, and Travis would let her in every time. It became somewhat of a routine and a dysfunctional situation that neither were happy with. Travis, although he enjoyed the sex, essentially wanted her out of his life, while Jody desperately wanted a serious relationship. Nothing and going off so a myriad of entries in her diary, she firmly held on to the belief that they were meant to be together. In late May of 2008, however, she would ultimately have a change of heart. Travis had a work retreat planned to Cancun, Mexico for July 10th. It was all paid for by his employer and allowed him to take a friend with him. Jody knew about this and believed, or at the very least hoped, that she would be the one going. Yet in the last week of May, it became known that Travis was taking another woman instead. Oh, a damn. Mormon girl by the name of Mimi Hall, someone that Travis had I'm been romantically soon. interested in for some time. When Jody found out, it would be safe to assume that she was heartbroken. It would be even safer to assume that she was absolutely enraged, and the collective opinion is that a specific thought process began to emerge in her mind one that forged a psychological justification for a certain decision. On June 4th, 2008, six days before Travis was set to leave for Mexico, Jody would once more show up unannounced. All we know for sure is that they had sex and took explicit pictures of each other using Travis's new camera. At roughly 5 p.m., Travis would get in the shower and Jody would begin taking pictures of him using the same camera. Then, moments after this picture was taken, Jody would stab Travis a total of 27 times. She would also cut his it's throat and shower. shoot him in the face. During the onslaught, Travis's camera took two accidental photographs. The first was taken as Jody dropped it during the onset of the attack. The second was taken as she kicked it by mistake while moving Travis's body. It showed Jody's foot and a fatally wounded or deceased Travis. The amount of time that passed from the two photographs was 62 seconds. Jody then spent an estimated 45 minutes cleaning uh, down the crime the scene to make sure none of her DNA was left behind. This included wiping down the victim's body with a cup of water and a cloth. 
She also deleted the pictures from Travis's camera gonna? before throwing it in the washing machine. She would then drive back out into the desert and leave Travis a voicemail for the purpose of I'm gonna? placing herself away from the crime scene and giving herself an alibi. I know Leslie called you, so I already talked to her, so uh, you can call her back if you want, but it's not necessary. Um, my phone died, so I wasn't getting back to anybody. Um, and what else? Oh, and I drove 100 miles in the wrong direction. Over 100 miles, thank you very much. So yeah, remember New Mexico? <clears throat> it was a lot like that. Only you weren't here to prevent me from going into the three digits, so fun, fun. Tell you all about that later. Um, also, we were talking about, <clears throat> when we were talking about your upcoming travels my way, I was looking at the May calendar, duh. So I'm all confused. Um, but Heather and I are going to see Othello on July 1st, and we would love for you to co accompany us. Let me know, and I will talk to you soon. Bye. End of message. Jody would then drive to another man's house in Utah by the name of Ryan Burns Six, and stay the night. He would later testify that nothing seemed off about Jody's behavior, only that they kissed and engaged in sexual intercourse. Travis's body was discovered by Mimi and her friends five days later, the day before they were supposed to leave to Cancun together. How long were you there trying to get into the house? Um, just, you know, a couple of minutes. I banged on the door, rang the doorbell over and over again. Nobody answered. I was, I was scared that something might be happening to him because I knew that he had a stalker. Travis's friend on the phone um, suggested that we go in through the garage and look for him in the house. And then as soon as they said that they saw blood, that there's blood everywhere, I stopped looking and said he's dead, um, he's dead. And so immediately I called the police. After the news of Travis's death broke the following after, after, day, Jody this. called the police and offered to help with the investigation. She was then transferred to the lead detective, Esteban Flores, of the Mesa Police Department. The most notable detail of the phone call was that Jody agreed to provide a sample of her DNA. Over the following month, forensics were able to uncover the deleted photos from Travis's camera, and despite her best efforts, discovered Jody's DNA Blood. all over the crime scene. During this time, oblivious to the evidence that was building against her, Jody would post multiple pictures of her and Travis on Facebook, alongside emotional messages to Travis himself. She even sent his family flowers and a letter expressing her grief over his death. The Mesa Police Department launched their case against Jody on July 15th. 41 days after the murder. Jesus. Detective Flores would be the one to conduct her interrogation. He had spoken with her once over the phone and was present when she was fingerprinted and swabbed for DNA. The Siskiyou County Police arrested Jody at her grandparents' house at 7.35 a.m. and only said they had a warrant for her arrest without giving further information. She was placed in handcuffs and didn't once ask what she was being arrested for in the six-minute drive to the local police station. What makes Jody Arias stand out among the many cases in the realm of true crime is the manner in which she attempts to navigate the system. She seems to believe that if she presents herself in a certain way and adopts a very specific character with very specific traits, it will give her the best chance at evading the consequences of her actions. In her mind, this character is a soft-spoken, sweet-natured, God-fearing individual yet to everyone else, is quite possibly the most universally annoying person to ever abide in the history of existence. <laughs> Jesus. They, they did it. They're just... In the next moment, Jody will hear Detective Flores approaching the room. She will then abruptly place her head on the table to make it appear as if she's sleeping. She will now notice the detective has instead walked past the room and then revert back to her regular sitting position. For whatever what? reason, Jody wants to appear as if she's in a far calmer state than she actually is. She wants the detective to believe that she's relaxed enough to doze off, when she is in fact extremely alert and anticipating his arrival. She places her head back on the table to feign a placid state once more. And you'll notice her left shoulder hovers in what looks like a very uncomfortable position for just over a minute. 
She then hears the external door open, at which point she takes a deep breath and then fully rests onto the table. This is something like when you're, when you're a child and your parents are coming to see if you're asleep and you put your head on the fucking pillow. Does she remember me? Of course I do. <clears throat> I traveled all the way up here to come talk to you. Because, you know, I've been working on Travis's case ever since it happened, mm -hmm. okay? And I know exactly when it happened, when he was killed. I know a lot of details, and just recently we found quite a bit of evidence, and I'll discuss that with you. By the way, by the time, Chad, just to remind you guys, they, um, the forensic team clutched it, and they, they recovered all the pictures that were deleted from the camera. The main thing that I'm looking for, though, is answers on why certain things happened, why they went so far, and also get your statements. Okay. <clears throat> How? She's been brought to a police station in handcuffs and now just told her arrest is concerning the death of her ex-lover. An innocent person sitting in her position would want immediate clarification as to what exactly is going on. Jody doesn't inquire further, just gently accepts to cooperate after being given a very vague, yet highly accusive clarification of the situation. A lot of details on this case that haven't been released to to the public and not even to Travis's family. And those details are known only by us and the person who did it, okay? And, and that's one of the reasons I'm here, is because uh, I believe that you know some of these details. And I oh. think you can help us. I would love to help you in any way that I can. Okay. Um, because we're here at the police department, the sheriff's department here in, uh, was it Siskiyou County? Siskiyou. That's what it's called, okay. Um, and you're considered uh, under arrest or detained, you're not free to go, and I'm a police officer, I have to read you your rights, okay? I'm sure you've heard them on TV, you, uh, you know, I have to read them off this little card here. But oh, yeah, yeah, downplay it, not sound too, to you Chad, go, Chad, okay. yes, it kind of downplay it, not sound too formal, otherwise it, it, she's going to say where she thinks it's, it's, it's GGG arrested, jail GGG. <laughs> And, uh, you know, if, if there's a question that you don't want to answer, you don't feel comfortable, you can say no, you know. And, no? Or, yes. Or, you know, you can elaborate as much as you want. It, it's completely up to you. It's at your speed. Mm -hmm. I don't want to pressure Is you. Is this recorded at all, or um, should we? I, think, yeah, I, don't, I, don't I don't know if there's a recording or something. I don't know if these are voice recorders. I noticed them. They have video. They have audio or they're, batteries or what? I don't think they're on. Hindsight allows us to recognize this is simply an attempt to appear innocent. She seems to think that if she appears confident enough to recommend the use of an outdated voice recorder, that it will seem as though she has nothing to hide in the eyes of the detective. But it's just bizarre. If the detective wasn't bizarre. already certain of Jody's guilt, he would most certainly become suspicious at this moment. Very it's okay. you still yeah, I haven't touched those or anything, but... Uh, oh, okay. Um... Jody's mind would be racing here, yet she desperately wants her exterior self to appear calm. She's so focused on having this nonchalant disposition that she completely fails to realize her behavior doesn't match the situation whatsoever. She's in a state of hyperarousal while feigning a state of composure, and the end result just looks very strange. It gives reason for her unusual infatuation with a voice recorder, and also for her oncoming sitting position which really can't be described, only compared to a sea lion peeking over a rock. And they're not on, so what I want to do is just get to the bottom of it. Everybody wants to know, okay? And, okay. you know, so I'm going to ask you some questions. You can voluntarily answer them if you want, okay? Is that cool? Yeah. Yes. Okay, dude. There was some question about you being, um, well, let's, let's start with this. What have you been up to since um, since Travis's death? What what have you been doing? Um. Well, I've been working. Mm -hmm. I haven't been really working in prepaid legal. There's not a whole lot um, here in this marketplace, which is it's kind of small here. 
it's small here, and really that, sh that could be seen as an opportunity um, rather than um, a hindrance, because that just means the market is, is untapped in a large way. So I could have if I wanted to, but now what? I have, I'm kind of like a deer in the headlights when it comes to prepaid legal, and I, kinda, I just have a fear of just approaching people. Um, You'll come to notice that Jody will go off on these unrelated tangents anytime she has the slightest chance to do so. It's a recurring theme in interrogations for when the suspect is facing serious charges. And the common theory is that it's an attempt at gaining a momentary escape from what is likely the most terrifying moment of their life. Going into detail about topics completely unrelated to the situation at hand essentially delays the onset of their new reality. Forensic psychology views this as a form of denial and also a subconscious coping mechanism. Yeah. This particular tangent was about the local climate and multi-level marketing. But she'll also ramble about photography, religion, relationships, Multi spirituality, household pets, her ex-boyfriends, road trips, hitchhiking, designer clothing, and computer virus software. The detective subtly nudges her away from the theme of network marketing and onto the topic of Travis. She starts off with a Facebook post Jesus. she made in his memory. I realized looking back on it that it was kind of, it kind of sounded immature. So it's more of like my dear Travis kind of letter. And so I took it down because... More personal. Yeah, some of it was details, <clears throat> more personal. Not too personal, nothing inappropriate. Just, um, I just felt funny. I think because I'm a photographer, I tend to communicate more through pictures, so I posted a ton of pictures that I had of him, um, and I have a ton more that I just can't access Sure, right a now. photographer, of course. And videos and things that I know his family would want, but, um... She then explains how it's hard to talk about Travis's death with the guy she's now dating. And we've been talking a lot, and we try not to talk about that, because it's kind of like, ugh. And plus, Travis is my ex-boyfriend, but at the same time, he's my friend, so while I'm mourning my friend, how do you talk to your new potential possible maybe person that you might start dating about your friend even though he was your ex-boyfriend so it's kind of a gray area the detective knows she'll what? happily trail off until the morning comes so he cuts her off and locks her into the situation at hand and i've talked to a lot of people and everybody's pointing a finger at you you know everybody is saying i don't understand what happened to travis i don't know who killed him but you need to look at jody and sometimes the simplest answers are the correct ones. One of the most fascinating parts of this interrogation is how long the detective allows Jody to cling on to hope. For the first 45 minutes, she will be terrified, yet still believe there's a chance she will be going home at the end of it. The detective will hint at her suspicions and culpability in a gradual manner, yet not directly accuse her until a much later stage. Dangling the idea of hope above someone's head while simultaneously hinting at the grim future that awaits them would perhaps be considered cruel in most other circumstances. Yet on this occasion, it is tolerated for a tactical purpose, which is to allow for as much divulgence from the suspect as possible. Her fear will cause her to panic, not enough to the point where she completely locks up, but just enough so that she continuously tries to claw at her own salvation, and in the process will divulge information that will be extremely damaging to her defense later on. And that's one of the reasons I started looking at you Ooh, okay. a little closer. And over the last month or so, I, I've, I've gotten into Travis's life, talked to all his friends, his family, I got a really good understanding of who he is now. And I got a very good understanding of your relationship with him. Obviously you weren't boyfriend and girlfriend anymore, mm -hmm. but you were still having a sexual relationship, which, Does you know, his family know about that? Just curious. No, just his family doesn't know. Haha, <laughs> so funny. Yeah. I just, I mean, I'm interested in protecting his, how he's remembered as well. and. Fuck off. Just for the purpose of integrated context, at Jody's trial, she would label Travis a sexual deviant, a domestic abuser, and a pedophile. He, he truly had feelings for you. And for some reason, he felt that the relationship between you and him was somewhat unhealthy, but he couldn't stop it. And I assume that's probably maybe the same way you felt about him, or... It's Maybe you didn't understand why he didn't believe it was healthy. Yeah, that's no, I, I didn't think it was healthy either, spiritually at least, and probably emotionally, but mostly spiritually. And I think that kind of once you have something that's not healthy spiritually, it filters through all aspects of your life. 
Her dialogue alters from spirituality to her work history and then to her finances before moving uh, on to her family. Bear in mind she wasn't asked about any of this. Financially, I wasn't Who, doing well. No? I missed Who my asked? family. I moved away. Um, shortly after high school and I come back to visit but I realize over the years I've missed out on a lot of things with my little brother and sister oh out, my god their karate or their baseball or cheerleading or the detective nudges her back to the subject of Travis once more. He asks if the sexual element combined with his religion was the reason the relationship didn't work. Jody then takes it upon herself to recount her sex life history and simultaneously preach about her own devotion to the Bible. I've, I've been, I've had a couple of serious relationships before where I was, where I was intimate with a few people. And it's kind of silly, but I used to always joke that, um, Regardless of what the Bible says, and yes, I'm Christian, I just live my life by the Ten Commandments, and that's my, those are my rules. Da, 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 da. You know, thou shalt not this or that, but it doesn't say thou shalt not mortgage. So I just, I just used to joke about that. We did pray by him, uh -huh. we knelt by his bed once, and, um, and surprisingly, he suggested it. Normally, you know, we would, I would suggest that we pray before we go on a trip or before we eat, if we're alone. That was kind of unusual for him, huh? Yeah, because he was very resistant to prayer. He's like, so I'd say, will you say a prayer? He's like, why don't you say a prayer? Um, why don't you say a prayer? Why don't you say a prayer? So we'd go back and forth. Jody, will you say a prayer? And I said, sure. And, and Travis was like, <laughs> The detective endures as much Funny. prayer talk as humanly possible before shifting the topic once more. He was at a point in his life where he wanted to really start settling down. He felt like he needed to kind this of This guy's getting stalled. Mm -hmm. You know, become a husband, become a father. Did you guys ever discuss possibly getting married or anything? Is when that... we were dating, we did. Okay. Once we broke up, he brought it up. He actually proposed to me a lot of times, but he wasn't serious. Um, well, let's move to after the breakup. Smiling okay. and laughing, huh? What, um, what kept you in Mesa at that point? I actually moved to Mesa a few weeks after we broke up. Really? Mm-hmm. I and mean, then it was a time period he really wasn't seeing anybody, and then Mimi came into the picture. Um, uh -oh. What did you think about her? And I didn't know a lot about her. She seems like a really nice girl. He showed me her picture on Facebook. You know? Okay, dude. I she had a lot of pictures on there. Um, he said that... He's not sure uh, why. Did but this stalker did it. she know everything about her profile? How many pictures? What the pictures sure out? That she could did be it. And I was happy for him. Um, I didn't find out about the conversation. She stalked 100 percent Yeah, yeah, it was in okay. his room. Um, and he had his laptop, you know, just on his bed. Um Jody is desperately trying to make it appear as though her and Travis were on good terms. But this is just overkill. Jody was labeled the crazy stalker ex by all of Travis's friends and even Travis himself. The idea that he would show and then discuss any potential future romances with Jody is ridiculous. And, and I truly believe he, he, he does love her still. Oh, he but does. He Travis had, had a, he's what you call a player. You know what that means. He, he kind of um, pulls he girls in. Anybody, Look at it. He was reluctant to make a, a, a commitment Look at first her. off. And truly, he didn't think that you were marriage material. Did she think that she's teaming up with him? And I don't know why not. I mean, I see you. You're 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 a wonderful girl. You're you know you're struggling. You're, you're trying to, to to make your way through life. And I don't see why you guys couldn't have made it. I you think know. we're just, we have, we have very different philosophies mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Um, we would argue about the dumbest things, and like, there were so many times where I just couldn't wrap my mind around what he would, I could, but, but I would try to get him to do the same for me. Like, there was a time when I broke down on the way to L.A. once, and my, my car got a flat tire, so I had at the time roadside assistance because my car was still under warranty, and they, pulled, they went to take the car and to change the tire and realized that when they sold me the car, they didn't give me the wheel lock key. Um, and I was kind of hungry. It was dinner time. It was 7.38 and it was dark. Oh, it was 7.38. Um, and the tow truck guy said, you know, there's a Denny's two blocks down here and there's a Jack in the Box there. And he was driving me to the motel. I said, is there an IHOP around? Because I really like IHOP. He's like, yeah, but it's kind of like five miles back in the other direction. I was like, uh, okay. He's like, I can drive you there if you want. And I was like, he's like this short Mexican guy. And 
he seemed really harmless and I was like, uh, okay. And he, you know, and I asked him about his life and he had a wife and kids and oh. so he wasn't flirting. The travels of Jody and the sweet Mexican continues on for another two minutes. The detective then brings Jody's attention to what he already believes was the trigger motive for the murder. So, you know, moving over to his trip to Cancun that he was going to, um, when did you first find out about that? That he was going with me. Oh, I didn't find. I found out about that at his memorial services. Um, no shots. It was the Monday night memorial service. Okay. You didn't I, know he was taking me. I didn't know that. I think that's awesome, actually. Fuck, did right. Yeah. Um, well, unfortunately, Mimi had called him a week or two before. And uh, I told him, look, if you want to take somebody else, it's fine, but I have oh, something to tell you. Oh, awesome. I don't look at you that way. Mm -hmm. I don't look at you as a boyfriend. If you want to be friends, we can be friends. The detective essentially stated that Travis was friend-zoned by Mimi, but he still invited her instead of Jody anyway. What, what kept you to him? That's, that's cool. That's, that is extreme well, copium. Moving is expensive for one. So once I was there, I was kind of stuck there. Um, but was, why do you continue to go back to him? You know what he wants. You know that it's not healthy. But yet you continue to go back. And it brings us to this point where we are now. Part of that, part of my um, perspective now has to do with the fact that I'm going through a repentance <coughs> process that I've worked out with, you know, with my bishop. And he's given me, you know, certain scriptures to read and, and ponder and pray about. And Preacher Jody emerges for another two minutes going uh. into detail about scriptures and baptisms. The detective then interjects and starts getting more confrontational with the facts about Jody's behavior towards Travis. And obviously you guys kept this relationship hidden from everybody else and, uh, because nobody really knew about it. Well, um, there were some people who, who I talked to and said, yeah, they continued to have a relationship even after they broke up. And there are others who said, who were saying that you had become obsessive with him. Oh, damn. To where you would uh, go into his house when he wasn't there or when you were Not just about to get mauled for sure, right? And he would talk to people saying, you know, she, she just kind of showed up and I don't want to tell her to leave, but... Uh, well, 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 I can see how, how this could start right now from this point on, because now you show that, that the public thinks something that's the detector or a character, and that's about to lose it. Come on, right? Oh, there were a, that was yeah, must have been early on, because yeah. there were a couple times when we established a rule early on, just don't, you know, don't come over unless, he said, you can come over any time, but I need to know first. The detective then starts ramping up the pressure and brings Jody's alibi and road trip into the discussion. Was it the sure. week of the, well, the first week of, of June? You took a trip to Salt Lake City. Which route did you take from, from there? I was supposed to get on the 15 and go all the way up. Uh -huh. And I somehow South got Utah. off the 15. Where did you go? Like a five, six hour drive? Then? Um, for a while I was lost. And I'm not above sleeping in the car, so I slept for a while. Okay. I'm a heavy sleeper and I sleep a lot, so. But you were on the 15 for a while, mm -hmm. and you ended up getting off the 15 somewhere. Yeah, I I, I looked at a map, and I'm pretty sure I know where I went. 10. I went, can I draw you a map? Sure. So this trip took you a little over 48 hours, so. Mm -hmm. um, I have a problem with this trip. Well, okay. I went first, too. Yeah, I know. Okay. I thought you went down here. I've gone over this trip over and over in my mind. Oh, and she's throwing it. And even if, if there's still 20 some odd hours, even if you pulled over to sleep a couple of times. Oh, did I tell you that I got stranded? Yeah. Okay. You mentioned that. If you slept for 10 hours. I only slept for Here hours. and here, it would still leave. 18 some odd hours for something else. Okay. This is what people are focusing on is this trip that you took. Because they're saying she left, she didn't get to till Thursday. Yikes. Wednesday. That's when Travis was killed. I did not go near his house. Okay. Isn't there. I pulled your cell records. Ooh. Your cell phone was turned off between here 
in here. Well, Holy shit! And then magic. Chat, chat. If you talk to people, what uh, people? He has records, uh, cell records, whatever, and he has deleted pictures, and she doesn't know about any of this. Dude, this is a these the, the interviews are like they're like minefields. Mm -hmm. You found your charger here. It's, it's it was, impossible. It was under the packed under the seat of the passenger side, and it was when I was when you were lost, you couldn't have maybe pulled over and found it. Or... Well, I did finally start looking when I was stranded. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have pulled over when I was lost. Detective Flores explains to Jody multiple times over how the trip doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And whether it's feigned guys, naivety... Yes, yes, one small question. Okay, good chat. I probably only one. It's one. Let's say in, a, in an alternate reality, okay, where, where she, where, instead she, she just got a lawyer and didn't say anything, right? Wouldn't they have to put all this evidence and all these things into like discovery or whatever, and they, they would be able to take it, dissect it, create an argument, and create a story and a, and a defense against every point, and possibly even have a way better chance of this. Or that she literally could, right? doesn't understand the concept of time and distance. She pretends to be confused by the allegation rather than actually confront it. This goes on for three minutes before the detective confronts Jody with the evidence of the photographs on Travis's camera. But I don't think you're being completely honest with me about, about that trip. I honestly got lost. It's... It's bad timing. Were you at Travis's house on Wednesday? Absolutely not. I was, n I was nowhere near Mesa. Was the photos? We always skip them, I'm pretty sure. Nowhere near no. Phoenix. <sighs> I wasn't even close to him. Um, what time? What if I could show you proof you were there? There's Will that change your mind? Uh oh. I wasn't there. You can be honest with me, Joey. I was not at Travis's house. I was not. You were at Travis's house. You guys had a sexual encounter, which there's pictures. And I know you know there's pictures because I have them. Oof. I will show them to you. Ah! Okay. So, what I'm asking you uh, is for you to be honest with me. Look at her face, dude. I know you were there. Are you sure those pictures aren't from another time? Positive. Remember I told you about the camera? Mm-hmm. The card's intact. Remember I told you that card was destroyed? Mm -hmm. I didn't want to tell you the truth. Oh man. And I have pictures of you in Travis's bedroom with Travis. Pictures of him. Oh, Mustard. It's obvious you guys are having sex. Taking photos of each other. And they're <laughs> dated and time stamped on the day he died. Are you sure it's me? Skip. See yeah. what? See what? No, they're not showing it. Because I'm not there. It's you. Shh. Come on, huh? And you know it's you. I know all the details of this case. The only thing I don't know is why. Why did you choose to go visit Travis that day? And why did you do what you did? I've never why heard did you? Travis. You did. You hurt him. That's why we're here. That's why I flew up here. Because I needed to talk to you about this. I can just arrest you and throw you in jail, but I want to know why. Why did you do this to him? I wouldn't hurt Travis. He's done so much for me. Sean. I know you took pictures of him in the shower just before he died. I don't think he would allow that. Mm -hmm. Wait, he just yeah, told you he had the pictures. I took a couple of photos by accident. Uh. During the time he was being killed. Really? Yeah, Joey, really. You were there. Quit playing this game. It's time for you to just come out and, I and tell know. me. I didn't know. I did not hurt Travis. Really, dude? The glitch? Travis. Really? They glitched? I wouldn't do that to him. 
The detective then goes on to explain the DNA evidence collected at the crime scene, which includes Jody's blood, Jody's blood mixed with Travis's blood, Jody's hair, and Jody's bloody palm print. You either had blood on your hand, and you touched the wall, or there was blood on the wall, and you touched the blood. Could my palm print have already been there and the blood touched it? Jody. Jody. I mean, this, this is business is case closed already. This is absolutely over. You need to tell me the truth. Listen, the truth is I did not hurt Travis. If you want, I can show you some pictures of him. Do you want to see pictures of him? I don't. Part of me does and part of me doesn't. Why, because you don't want to remember? No, I just, Jody. there's a morbid curiosity. Jody. I wanted to know how he died. We can keep playing these games over and over again. I'm not going to believe you. Was it? I, it's over. Could it have been my blood from before? Your image is not important right now. Saving the rest of your life is. Listen, the, the if blood I'm from found before. Guilty, I don't have a life. I'm not guilty. I didn't hurt Travis. If I hurt Travis, if I killed Travis, I would beg for the death penalty. It just seems so impossible. Uh -oh. I want to see it. I want to know. I mean, I'm not like, I'm not a murderer, but I guess if I were to do that, I would wear gloves or, you know, something. Okay, let's say for a second that I did. Well? And I say, I did it. Mm -hmm. I mean. The motive is there. The jealousy issue. But I wasn't, I wouldn't even say it was jealous. I mean, there, I mean, there may have been some jealousy there, but then what is I think it? if what anyone... Causes? I mean, he attacked her character, now she's fucking molding. I think if, you know, if anyone, maybe Travis was jealous, but... <clears throat> That's not what everybody else says. Oh, well, was he jealous? He has a new girlfriend. I can prove it. But what I don't have is I don't have answers on why it happened. Or... You know, maybe something just got out of hand. Just, maybe, maybe things got out of hand. Did you and, guys, you guys, the, guys, how is she so mold that the guy told her what he knows and she told him what he, what she knows, right? And then she tried to paint him at him as jealous when he has a new girlfriend. He, she's alone and she shows up in the middle of the night to his house. The gun? Maybe that would. It, it really makes. It, there's absolutely no logic here. We're just playing games here. I'm gonna take a little break, but I need you to think about what you're doing here. Because the best thing for you to do is to... I wasn't his GF, okay. Tell me the truth. Makes sense. It, it's so important that you tell me... why this occurred, what was going through your mind, and what caused you to do this. I'll let you think about it. I was it. cooking hot buckets. Okay, and yeah, I'm gonna go look for some pictures, and I'll bring them over. So he's cooking hot buckets, like, right behind this discussion. Okay, let me go find it. Tips, I'm not a murderer. Okay. Okay, 3.730. Hello? It's a Glock. I just bought a gun. Did you? Oh, Jesus. Okay. Found it by now. Yeah. Oh, I was taking it somewhere. These are just a few photos. Uh, uh, 37 what? 37, 38? Guys, I have a whole minute to skip. Um, 37... What now? 37, 37, 37. 37. And I want to be careful showing, not showing you certain photos. Please because some of them me. are very... bad. If Travis were here today, he would tell you that if it wasn't me. My job is to speak for Travis right now. 
and everything Travis is telling me. That's just for a minute. Is that Jody did this to me. Who's that one? This is just his face. Remember him? Yeah. Jody is then shown one of the pictures that was taken by accident while she was in the process of murdering Travis. The your foot, Jody. Those are your pants. No, it's off color because we had to enhance it and the color kind of changes a little bit. That's Travis. And hands. It's a picture I showed earlier. This is his bathroom. There's blood in one That's not my foot. Sure. Couldn't even recognize Travis. He'd been there so long. Do you have any recent cuts that are healed? Well, my cat scratches me. Little things. Is it over now? Do, do I? Do These I? all her work. You can see. This is her. That's her. I've got scars. She's very, she's a feral cat. All these little things are her. Well, enough about your cat, but there's no doubt in my mind that you were there. There's no doubt in my mind that you did this. None. So you can go and take your blue in the face and tell me you weren't there and you had nothing to do with it. I won't believe you. I want to know why. That's, it's killing me inside. I don't know why. Thing, like, there's no reason for it. There's no reason why. There's no reason I would ever want to hurt him. And I have a solid case against you. And I can present it to the judge. As cold as, as, as it is now. I don't know why she did it. Or I can present it to the judge. With your explanation. If I'm found it's guilty, what happens? You don't have to pay the price. Well, what's the price? What do you think? Don't, don't you know what the sentences are? The, the sentences that are carried for something? It depends kind of on your situation. How old you are. It depends on the type of crime. It depends on whether you show remorse or not. And part of that remorse is at least coming clean. When somebody doesn't come clean, I don't see any remorse. I know you're afraid, but you're already going through it right now. There's no backing up. There's no backing up to yesterday. Is, is There's that no made? backing up to that day. It's already happened. And unfortunately, you're gonna have to face the consequences. Um, you know, if, if I did that, I would, I'd be fully ready to face the consequences. Okay, well, um, I'm not really for things like, you know, I'm all for the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just can't. I didn't kill Travis. Okay. I just didn't. I did not take his life. You need to come out and tell me why this happened. I will not accept any other excuses. I will just move on with my investigation with my final report, submitting all the conclusions and all the evidence. And we can just let a judge and a jury decide. We can leave it in the hands of a jury. Test? We can do that, that's fine. Would that help me at all? I mean, oh yeah. You can't use them in court, but. Well then there's no point in taking it. I took a knife to him and couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. And before you knew it, it was all over. And then you panicked. And then you... I would, I've never been angry, that angry at him. Not enough for that. I've been so far angrier at other people, at other ex-boyfriends. Then tell me, who could have done this? <clears throat> who did this? I don't know, but if I am... If I go to trial for this, and if I'm convicted for this, whoever did this is going to be sitting very pretty somewhere. Glad that it wasn't them. Okay, and it's dude. my job to make sure that an innocent person does not go to jail. But I don't see an innocent person sitting in front of me. Travis, I don't 
Travis has done a lot for me, and I wouldn't hurt him. Yeah, she said that before. He introduced the gospel to me. Why is everybody saying that you are capable of hurting him? Everybody says it. I don't know why anyone. So don't tell I'm me capable. that you're not capable. I don't even hurt spiders. Okay. I kicked a dog once. <gasps> I was a freshman in high school, and I love, love, love animals. And one, we had this dog, his name was Doggy Boy, and my parents, until this dog that they have now, have never been able to, and I don't mean just them, we as a family have never been able to care for a dog properly as far as give it attention and take it for walks and be consistent. Why is she saying to all this save shit? you the oncoming ramble about Doggy Boy the dog, she lightly tapped him with her foot for tearing open the trash, and she's felt so bad ever since that it changed her entire worldview on the animal kingdom. She now apologizes to the dog, through the detective, who's conducting her interrogation for first-degree murder. And yeah. I need to right apologize on. for that to him. I know it sounds well, weird. Dead. My relationship with animals, it's kind of like they're like people too, you know, they have souls. What you need to do is you need to apologize to Travis. Should you just refuse? Yeah, you know, I can't help you anymore if you're not gonna, if you're not gonna help yourself. You ask me really prior. Can't. I can't, Jody. It's fascinating to observe how fast she can switch from one emotion to the next once she realizes a particular strategy hasn't worked. The attempt at elevating her character by expressing how much she cares for spiders and pets hasn't seemed to have any effect on the detective. So she then switches her disposition from sorrowful to analytical, as she once more tries to manipulate his perception of her. If I did anything that had anything to do with his death in any way... Well, she's too though. It's not if to me. I wouldn't... It's not if. It's not if at all. Well, to me it is. I would, I would be more than remorseful. So maybe something you're blocking out of your head? I don't think so. I mean, I tend to write everything down. I tend to... I just finished the book, The Road Less Traveled. Mm -hmm. And he said, um... The true definition of sanity is dedication to reality at all costs. Mm -hmm. Well, this is definitely reality. We are sitting here inside of an office. Huh? The sheriff's department. And you are facing first degree murder charges. Who said that? What is and the you are going to be booked into jail. And eventually you will be brought back to Arizona. And you will stand trial. That's the reality. And once you realize that, I think you'll be better for it. I've had worse issues with other people. They're all still alive. I'm still friends with my ex-boyfriends. They're all still alive. You know, I've been doing this a long time. And there's one thing that I can never get out of my head. Ever since the first day I talked to you. It's, there's an old saying that, you know, someone's just not acting right. Look into it. You have not acted right from day one. You're just not acting right, Jody. You're acting like somebody who's guilty. How so? Is he? You tell me. How so? I know because I've been doing it a long time. It's, it's taken me a long don't... time to, to figure it out. But within the first 30 seconds to a minute of a conversation, I can, I know when somebody's acting right. There's a certain way people act. How did I act? Okay. It was it's not like, think. it's not like TV. It's not anything like that. It's not what you see in the oh. movies. Is it because I'm not crying? No. It's not because of that. What is it? I mean, I'm not going to change how I act. No. Oh, 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 oh no. Oh, no. Oh, life doesn't try that already. You're, you're sincere in the way you're acting. She's done that like 40 times, she's asking for advice, dude. Well, how is you're, it? Just, you're just not telling the truth. How is it different? Well, it's not really something... Late context, she killed her boyfriend because she's a stalker. After Jody failed her attempts to extract inside knowledge on the best way to behave in order to appear innocent, she then yeah. attempts to explain why she hasn't been able to appear innocent. It's not that I'm not remorseful that he died. The reason I hesitate is because... Remor Maybe this is something that's wrong with me psychologically, is I think of the butterfly effect. 
and it's like oh my you can god the guy pumping gas station you can get pumping gas down at the gas station could have potentially because you see all these movies these funky movies where it's like this affected this which affected this which affected this oh, if he had never done this i know if you had never met him you'd probably still be alive <laughs> that's true yeah that's because you killed him no i just can't admit to something that i didn't do if it would help if it would help my case and give me an easier sentence, I know that people plead guilty for those things. No, and I don't want you to do that. Oh, she wants time off for guilty plea? That is the absolute last thing I want. I wish that I had answers. I'm sorry. There's just no reason. There's just no reason. There's no good reason why this happened. There's never a good reason why somebody dies like this. Jesus. No shot that works. This seems to be the moment Jody fully confronts the reality of her situation. The anguish she has over her own fate will become visible, yet she will now disguise this anguish as grief over Travis's death. She does this by posing a question. How many times was Travis stabbed? You would know. More than I want to remember. I would Chat, ever Chat. want to hurt. Yeah, isn't she using the, the, the state of, of crying to, to throw in like sympathy or whatever when in fact she, she's only crying about her because of what's happening to her and what's going to happen to her or whatever. She's crying about All I know is the that. consequences and she's swooping in sympathy and shit in there. I need a story or else it's just cold. It's oh, so, so you said? Oh, I didn't cold. listen, sorry. But without the truth, I can't paint another picture. And it's going to be up to the prosecutor to paint that picture. And if you want that prosecutor, and I've met him, and you don't want him painting that picture. I, I have to maintain my innocence. I can't admit to doing something that I haven't done. There's just no Well, reason. I have more work to do. Can you give me a rundown of what's going to happen from here when you leave? Yeah, you're, uh... Like, just today. They all example. do this, I, I noticed. They all do this. Well, you'll probably be taken across the street to the county jail. Uh, you'll be processed through there. Um, this is a really trivial question, and it's gonna reveal how shallow I am. <laughs> oh, no, she already did that. But we before all... they book me, can I clean myself up a little bit? You're gonna be taken the way you are. I can't give you anything else. Do I have to go in handcuffs everywhere? Mm -hmm. It's just procedure. No, that's because you're a killer. Whether Hello? You wrote a bad check or you're facing murder charges. You're gonna go in handcuffs. You should have at least done your makeup, Jody. Gosh. Shut up. I didn't hear. Ugh, so disgusting. <laughs> this act is a little just cringe though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jody was then taken. Yeah, this is something I noticed. Uh, all of them when they know they're filmed, they always end up acting sort of sort of crazy on purpose or some weird act. And whenever they think the guy sitting there is always their ally, and when he leaves. They think, oh, 
I, that's it. It's done so. And it's, it's trying to make him not leave. It's really he weird, dude. He went to the dude. county jail and charged with the murder of Travis it's just, it's Alexander. It's he eerie. stayed there overnight, and it would be a total of 16 hours before she was taken back to the Siskiyou County Sheriff's Office. Her second interrogation commenced at approximately 9.30 a.m. Just remember... Oh, this again! stand up for me as I take these cuffs off um, just go ahead and put your hands down at the waist okay the game plan for this second interrogation will be a lot more strategic investigators will have studied the footage the day prior and will now have a greater understanding of Jody's personality the initial tactic is for detective Blaney to criticize and berate the suspects character while simultaneously reinforcing fear and apprehension she makes it very clear from the offset that the suspect's fabricated naivety and sickly sweet persona will not work on this occasion, and Jody's self-esteem will be broken down in a manner that would typically be considered bullying or abuse under different circumstances. This is done so oh, that- Oh, she has to lay the fucking law in. Persona will not work on this occasion, and Jody's self-esteem will be broken down in a manner that would typically be considered bullying or abuse under different circumstances. Okay, here it this comes. is done so that when Detective Flores returns, it will be a welcome relief, and an immediate rapport will then be attained, which in turn will make the suspect far more likely to cooperate. It's a derivative of good cop, bad cop, and the two investigators execute this technique in a near-perfect manner. Detective Blaney's time with the suspect is essentially a non-stop psychological onslaught, which is sometimes executed in a passive manner, while other times in a far more direct manner. During the latter stages of the bad cop procedure, Jody will be asked if she would prefer to speak with Detective Flores instead. This question is posed a total of five times, and only on the fifth time will Jody finally give in and admit that she would. This will give her the impression that when Detective Flores finally returns, it was all her doing, rather than a calculated and prearranged strategy. Okay. Here it comes. The voice recorder isn't actually for the purpose of recording the conversation. It is a prop to reinforce the perception of Detective Blaney being the enemy, and not to be trusted. You'll notice that when Detective Flores returns, this device will be switched off, therefore reinforcing the idea that he is the friend who can be trusted. Today's date is um, July 16th, and my name is Detective Rachel Blaney, um, and I'm here with Jody Arias. Is that how you say your last name? Arias. Okay, I'm sorry. This is just formality, um, and this is, you know, if, if I have to, you know, write up a report of, of what we talked about, at least I know word for word, you know, what you said, and there's no mistakes. Mm -hmm. Okay. The reason that I wanted to talk with you this morning, <clears throat> there's a couple of reasons, actually. Let me say this. It's, it's obvious to me that, you know, you're not, um, uh, you're not our typical suspect. You know, you, you come from a, um, a good home, a good family. Your parents obviously care about you. Um, that was evident. Uh oh, you know, talked Jesus. To them yesterday. Um, and you're a bright girl. Um, probably uh, more intelligent than you were letting on yesterday. And there's no question in my mind or any of the other investigators' mind um, that you were the person that took Travis's life. But what I need to know, or what I'd like to know, and give you the opportunity to do, is determine whether, you know, you're a, a cold-blooded, cold-hearted um, murderer who slaughtered this guy, or are you somebody that got caught up in circumstances and things got out of control? When this hits the news, um, and, and it will, it'll go to the media, do you want to be portrayed as that cold-blooded, cold-hearted murderer? Because it, the media loves that. I'm trying to help you out. Yeah. I'm trying to give you a chance True. to to make things right. You know, show the families that you do have some remorse. 
but when you continue to deny, deny, deny when it's obvious that, that that's not the case, you appear to be the cold-blooded killer. And things are going to start moving real fast here for you. This is kind of a pause, you know, before things, you know, start getting heavy. This is, this is your opportunity to help yourself out. We don't need you to tell us anything. I'm doing this for you. Ah, uh, yes. It's a matter of, do you want to take control of your situation and paint the picture of who you are? Because you're the only one that knows that. The professional ruthlessness of this investigator is quite astonishing. The demeaning and sarcastic tone she manages to superimpose over straight facts is gripping to witness. You know, was it a matter of, um, like I said, um, this guy... Facts. Travis. Building some sort of, what you thought was some sort of relationship, you know, were you... Were you hoping for marriage? Is this something that you were hoping for? Was he was he leading you down that path? Um, you know, did he take advantage of you? Um, was there were there promises made that um, were were broken? Did he betray your trust in some way? I don't know. Only you know that. This is this is not going to go away anytime soon for you, Jody. She been replying. You know, you're a young, you're a young woman, um, just starting your life. You had a lot going for you. You should be fighting for yourself right now. And you let this eat at you. Had and it's going to destroy you. Or change you. In a way that you wouldn't want. Jody manages to veer off on trivial aspects of her and Travis's relationship that paint her in a positive light. Officer Blaney makes it very clear that she has far less patience than Officer Flores. With what appears to be a very sympathetic tone, she will snap the suspect's focus back to the element of the murder. As much as I love Travis, I just have always, there's something inside that says he's not the guy you're going to marry. So then what was it? What was it that, that led up to all of this? I mean, there's got to be something. So I honestly don't believe that, you know, that you're cold-hearted and you, you would just go and just, you know, kill somebody on a whim. That, that doesn't fit your profile. So what was it that, that led up to that? You know, you, you tell me. You tell them. You tell, you know, Travis's family. I'm just trying to fill in the, the holes there, you know, and just kind of guessing about the emotions. You know, what was it that would make you, you know, so angry or upset? Once Jody is forcefully brought back to reality, she all of a sudden has nothing to say. The passive yet disparaging tone of the detective must be a very hard thing for an individual to have to sit there and take, especially someone who has used their fabricated sweet nature to their advantage most of their life in order to avoid these types Ooh, of situations. Jesus, destroy her ego, dude. You're smart, you realize. Holy you're, fuck it. You're not gonna get a whole lot of other chances to do this, probably none. Once the, the wheels start turning, they move real fast. And you will be out of control then. You know, I'm, I'm a spiritual person myself, and I... I don't think... Oh, no, please don't, but... Not that kind of worms. That, you know, inside of me. I wouldn't want all of the, the ugliness of the lies inside yeah, she's, of me. She's gonna go off the handle on that topic for like an Take hour. Take a minute just to think about what I said. This Jody again. is clearly exhausted and terrified. She, at this moment, was being observed by both Detective Blaney and Detective Flores in another room. And they even contemplated having Detective Flores enter at this moment. They ultimately decided against it, however, and Detective Blaney re-enters the room to maximize this state of dejection. Oh the my. pressure will now be increased to a considerable degree. Maybe I did have the wrong picture of you. You know, all of this time that you and I have been talking, and I got information from your other interview. 
you are talking about insignificant things at this point. You're talking about money, you're talking about material things, you're, you're talking about everything but... I'm just talking you're about, talking about just, just people I care about. You're talking about everything but how bad you feel about Travis. You only respond to my questions If I were Travis, about I would Travis. be very remorseful. I think that I, I've gotten the wrong what? picture of you. I think that, you know... Then there's nothing I can say. No! You know, maybe I was wrong. Maybe maybe you are that cold-blooded person um, that they're trying to portray. And, um, you know, I'm just really confused. I just, at this point, you know, I, maybe you're right. Maybe there isn't anything that you can do to help yourself. Um, you know, I... Because you tried to give us herself so much maybe credit I was wrong. with that. Maybe you're not as intelligent as I thought you were. See, there you go. Maybe I was wrong. I don't know what else to, to do for you here, Jody. I'm kind of at the end of, of my rope. I was... <laughs> you're not going to get a whole lot of people that are trying to help you out along the way um, beyond this point. And what I'm hearing is somebody who doesn't give a rip about what happened. I'm hearing somebody that's worried about money, your appearance, Everything about you, I don't hear anything about Travis unless you're specifically asked. How do you think that looks? <clears throat> listen, I, it's, I don't care so much No, about you me. listen. You, you are not grasping the reality here, Jody. You are acting like the, the person that I portrayed, the ugly, cold-blooded murderer. Every time Jody breaks down, the detective immediately focuses on Travis's family. She makes it abundantly clear that she has absolutely no sympathy for the suspect despite her best efforts. I know Travis's family is struggling with why, and that would be the one thing that would give them closure. They may never like you, but I think that they would be appreciative of why their son's life was taken. I know if it was my child, that's what I would want. And I know that you're not a mother, but all women have those mothering instincts within them. And I think that you can understand that, what I'm saying. Was I off base, Jody? You're a very private person. She said person. no. Everybody has said that, and that's glaringly apparent. But all your business is going to be out in the open right now. So there's really nothing to hide from anymore. You know what I mean? And do you think at this point that your pride matters more than Travis's family's grief? For sure. <laughs> This is your chance to make at least something right, even if it's on a small scale. It's a big deal. To yeah, so that's what she would say, or think. This is your opportunity to make right on some of your selfishness. Was it angry at Travis? Everyone keeps what saying. What is it for you? Don't don't so say, guys. Yeah, yeah, don't don't don't, don't do shit like that. Don't say don't say. For you or you, uh, dude, that's just Rachel's. weird. That's really, that's just really weird. Was he expecting you to come over that day? What? Because guys, 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 it's weird, guys. I like watching those videos, but a lot of times, I guess, I try to like crack jokes that are just. I wish you understood how dark they are, though. Like, she was making the, the difference of um of her um trying trying to maintain her pride compared to to what's happened, to the terrible thing that she did, and people said, um, yeah, you would or whatever, or 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 you. Uh, no, I'm not, I I didn't kill anybody. This isn't like this. Like, don't don't fucking. I told him I wasn't going to. Don't pay me like that, it's fucking weird. So was it a surprise that you actually showed up? 
Jody no, I'm not soft. It's, it's literally weird. Jody prepares tangent about photography, but gets shut down right away. The detective doesn't allow her thoughts to keep wandering off on something unrelated as a means for attaining a brief distraction from reality. I got pictures of him once shaving, and then he was already weird about that. Well, Jody, when you say things like that, it's obvious to me that you don't want to do the right thing for the family. You don't want to um, unburden yourself. You don't want to give them closure. Um, and you're jerking my chain. And I don't appreciate my chain being jerked. I'm tired of playing games. I'm tired of skirting around it. I thought that it would be easier for you to talk to a woman, to say what you need to say to a woman. Sometimes it is. But unless you're willing to give me something, then I can't do anything for you. After today, things are going to go so fast for you, you're going to be totally out of control of the situation. The wheels of justice will start turning. I understand that you're afraid and that you're horrified about that person within you that could do something like that. But it happened, and it's a done deal, and you did. At least you At can this do this point, what do they want from her? Just, just say that? How it happened so they can understand why. I mean, do you think you're going to get this opportunity again? To sit down and just have a free-form discussion? There's not going to be any situation or place that's going to make it any easier for you. This is as good as it gets for you right now. Would you rather talk to him? Okay. Um... If you do, you know, that's that's fine, and I'm sure that he'd be willing to talk with you again. Or Ain't a motive. Would you rather continue talking with me? No, they have evidence 100%. Um, I don't, don't really have a preference, I guess. I don't know what it is that's going on inside your head right now. I don't know whether you're weighing the odds, um, you know, trying to figure out how you can save your own skin here. Don't you think that it's going to make just a little bit of difference inside yourself? Confession? As far as that closure goes, if you know that the family at least has something. And if you're not going to do that today with me right now, I'm just going to send you back across the street. <sighs> because we've been in here for a while. And I don't have, you know, yeah, back in jail. Day. I guess my patients are running a little thin. And if you think you're feeling grief over this whole incident, think about how they feel. For once, think about somebody else. And if you want to talk to Detective Flores as opposed to me, you know, you can do that. It, like I said, I thought it would be easier for you to talk to him. No, no shot she's even thinking about I somebody else. Do you want to talk to him because he has been in contact with their family? Fuck off. Them. No they shots. Can't. Okay. I don't know if that would make it She's only bringing this up because she brought it up. She gave her the idea of it. She didn't, she didn't think about anybody but herself the entire time from start to finish. Yeah, and I'm Not even sure once. That, you know, he has a, somewhat of a relationship with him. So I'll go see if he's... Yeah, I'm not trying to stall or anything, but I've got to go to the bathroom again. Can we go? Yeah. Hey. Well, Rachel called me and told me that you wanted to talk to me. Are you doing okay? It doesn't matter how I'm doing. It does to me. It Thank does. you, but it doesn't matter. What matters is how his family is doing. Okay. I told you yesterday I've been doing this for a long time, and, and you're absolutely right. You know, the the person's family who, who was hurt, they're obviously hurting. But there's a second family that hurts as well. And in this case, it's your family. <laughs> The objective of good cop, bad cop seems to have worked. A higher level of trust and rapport seems to now be established. Jody pours out her emotion as the detective offers a sympathetic and understanding tone. But then something very interesting happens. Once she composes herself, she for some reason requests to see the photos of Travis. Not before, but after he was murdered. Many could think she is attempting to gain some sort of depraved satisfaction from seeing them. Yet going off how the rest of this interrogation plays out, it's more likely that she is trying to gather information, or at least confirm something in the photographs, before she amends her new narrative. Huh? This is a more of a selfish reason. I think it might give me some sense of closure. I know it's kind of morbid. I don't even think I really deserve closure. What is it you want to know about the photos? Do you want to see the room? 
Do you want to see the bathroom, or do you want to see him? Or one thirty-two. Is it the photos before it happened that you want to see? I think the photos of after everything. I, I won't show you those. Are there? Is there any that you can? No. I can't do that. We had a difficult time identifying who he was by the time oh. we got there. He wasn't the same person. So that's why I don't want to, want to show you photos. The detective attempts to get the dialogue Crazy flowing bitch. in a subtle Jesus manner, Christ, yet he's that... given the silent treatment any time he poses an incriminating question. Jody knows exactly what she can and can't say with respect to her own preservation. Her internal self is far more calculated than the naive exterior she continuously portrays. So why were you there that day? Please tell me. Did you just miss him? Should I be looking for somebody else? Is there anybody else with you besides you and Travis? Are you protecting somebody else? The detective allows for extended periods of silence. Only Jody will know for sure what she was thinking. Yet one could safely assume she is desperately constructing her new narrative during these moments. I'm trying to just figure it out. I'm sure I tried a bunch of strategies now. It just makes her look stupid though. If I just told you every single detail that I know, and I gave you a confession, nothing else changes. It just speeds up the process. Oh, you can't lie about that, right? It's kind of, it's all really blurry. It really is blurry. Yeah, you can't. It's all a blur. Can I please see those photos? Why did you throw the camera in the washing machine? What? We found blood in the downstairs bathroom where somebody had tried to wash their hands. There's blood on the outside of the washing machine. There's there's little things that give us clues to what you were doing afterward. Everybody says he just leaves his doors open when, he, when he's home. Trust everybody. Um, have you ever seen the movie The Secret? I don't think so. This was the cue for Jody's next series of insufferable rambles. Oh the detective my God. valiantly endures this for the next 31 minutes to lower her guard. I used to go to sleep at night and I would hear gunshots. We weren't at that neighborhood, but our neighborhood neighbored another neighborhood that wasn't that great and gunshots carried. And there were, because Salinas is agricultural and there were a lot of fields and I used to think that they were hunters in the fields with their dogs. They were swinging by and pick up Amy. <laughs> I mean, and I wasn't there, I don't think. I was at work or something. I've never been in doubt, I've never been through the temple, but from what I understand, I think that's such a sacred place, and, and meditating there and being there will help to give you further insight about where. There were three fears. One was handguns, which is one of the reasons I got a gun. There was a CHP oh, oh, in town that said he would take oh, me on go target practicing. 31 minutes! No shot, dude! I went to the no shot, times to see what he had, and they were all in the five or $600 range for the kind that I wanted. So they were too expensive, but then there was this one, it was cheap. Jody's dialogue eventually winds up on the subject of Travis, and how Travis was private about the shower. The detective seizes the moment to catch Jody off guard. He subtly poses a highly incriminating question in a jokingly manner. He was very private about the shower, like we... Is that why you were taking pictures of him in the shower? No, <laughs> no. She doesn't deny she was there, only that she wasn't taking the pictures for that particular reason. She doesn't refute what is essentially an accusation, only a part of the context within it. This seems to be the moment where Jody realizes the holes in her story are beyond repair. She has to admit she was at least at the scene of the crime, and will now start to scramble her thoughts to garner the most self-preserving storyline. Trying to get back at them. No, um... Oh no. What went wrong? Did he say something to you? What did you do? Ooh, that was loud, Jesus Christ. 
that you plan on doing that the whole time. I don't believe you planned it. Jody. Please. I can't. Why not? It's falling apart again. Did someone catch you there? Someone not expecting you to be there? I see my car. Then who was it? I think whatever. <sighs> what? Listen, I will. I can tell you. I can tell you everything that I know or that I remember. Okay. What do you remember? Oh no, please, not another story. Is there any way I can see those pictures? I just. No, not right now. Can I see them soon? I will. I'm not. You need to start letting me know what happened. Okay. You're telling me that some other people were there. He was kneeling down in the shower. I don't remember him. If he, like, if this is his shower and the sink is over here, I was like right here taking pictures and I don't really know what happened after that exactly Wait, I think you now she's extremely toast though she already said this whole story about the 48 hours to fucking Utah or some sh or whatever the fuck right so that that's the, the ship is already sinking uh, it's already sunk Where were you? Um, if this is his shower, and he's sitting here, I was like, well, if this is his shower, and he's sitting here, I was like right here oh, Jesus. on my knees, and his bathtub is right here, and I was taking him here, and I was just going through the pictures, and I heard this loud ring. It's a little close, it's a little close, back up, murderer. I don't really remember, except Travis was screaming. I think I got knocked out, but I don't think it was that long. And there were two people there, and... What'd you say? Um... I remember... putting my hand on his back, because he was on his, all four of his knees. He was like... On his knees like this, doing something like this or something like I don't know. And I was like, I was like, are you, are you okay? What's going on? What's going on? He's like, go get help, go get help. And I said, okay. And I turned around. There this story's so bad. Then. Two people there. One was a guy and one was a girl. I I could couldn't tell that at first, but I could just see one was a girl and I assume the other was a guy because their build. And then their voices. Travis was screaming the whole time. He wasn't screaming like a girl. He was just like, like Man. he was in pain, like he was like shocked. Wait, like, oh. guys, guys, we, we learned. I feel like we learned so much from the other episode, right? Why, why? Whenever she, she, she reasoned, oh no, that that can't be true because this. And then her tone changes, right, from from crying and whatnot to analytical because she has to think because she can't maintain both at the same time. She can't both be sorrowful and, and, and cry. While, while uh, fabricating a, 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 an analytical lie or some shit. You can literally hear it. Travis was screaming the whole time. Oh, yeah. He wasn't screaming like a girl. He was just oh, like, like he was in pain. Like he was like shocked. Like, oh, mm -hmm. you know. What happened, Jody? What did you see? <laughs> I took it out like a little bitch. <laughs> He was still like conscious and still alive and um, But you just left him there. No, I, I ran into the closet and he stopped me and he didn't touch me, he was just held the gun to my head and he was like, You don't go anywhere. And he told he told the other girl to finish it. I didn't see. He told me to stay there and not to move. And where was that? In the closet? No, it was um she describes that the male stopped her from leaving, and then goes into detail about how her phone wasn't charged and how she forgot her phone charger. She then describes how she valiantly tried to save Travis from the female attacker. She was over him, 
and I just rushed her and I pushed her. In the next moment, she will state that the assailant comes back when she never went anywhere to begin with. Um, I, I got Travis and Wait, he let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me think about this. They already told her that, that she, after she was swabbed and fingerprinted that she, they saw her fingerprints on the wall and everything and she didn't think maybe this story is bad because they're not going to find a single hair, footprint, handprint, anything at all, in not even one thing. She didn't even think about this. Like she said this person is dumb ass story. She wasn't really doing much and, I was, and he was, I was trying to get him and she came back. I got him kind of far, like right here. She came back. He was starting to just get weaker and weaker. Chai, you know be good? You know be good? It, 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 took a, it took a one hour pause, they took away the, 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 the paper, they fully reset and they, they asked a bunch of random questions and they asked her, you know what, we forgot to say the story again and, and did it, did it, did she be able to reconstruct anything she said and all the feelings and, and all the dialogue that, um, and redraw the whole picture? Said, no shot. To, um, do me too because um, I didn't want to there and he's like no shots no that's not why we're here from what you're telling me she was the aggressive one and he was the more passive yeah i mean there was definitely a aggression as far as i mean i don't know what you define aggression by it like i was there was a definitely a sternness so it seemed like they knew him obviously yeah but he didn't seem to know them i mean he was a little out of it plus they had masks on anyway but he didn't express any kind of recognition. Well, masks now, okay. I could talk. The detective takes her back to the moment she tried to save Travis from the female attacker. Um, so I wasn't sure. I just knew I had to hold on to her hands because she had a knife. What oh. hand she have? She, she had it in this hand, but well, her, her right, I guess. So. Her right. Now again, from, from, from the crying to the calm thing. I just said, come on, come on. You know, he was naked, but I didn't care. Just come on. And he's like, I can't. I said, come on. He's like, I can't feel my legs. Jody had obviously seen a lot of bad movies. Bear in mind, this conversation she had with Travis was supposedly happening as she was simultaneously fighting off a knife-wielding attacker. She glosses over the struggle, and she somehow ends up outside the bathroom. The two assailants are now inside the bathroom, arguing with each other about Jody's fate. She hasn't stated whether Travis is alive or dead at this point. It wasn't like super yelling, it was kind of like hushed but mm -hmm. intense. Like, you need to da da da, shut up, it's not over here, things like that. The male assailant then takes Jody's registration out of her wallet and looks at her address. He said, if you ever, ever, ever say anything about this, so they'll do to my family the same way and me. And I didn't care so much about me at that point. He said, you need to leave. Guys, th this. And don't you call anybody? And don't you say anything? He's on this book wouldn't anything. sell for shit. And she said she's going to rat us off. She's going to say something. And he was like, shut up. He was like, you get one chance. Jody then leaves in her car. She of course doesn't mention the fact that she then left Travis a voicemail to give herself an alibi for not being there. I was really scared. Okay. I was really freaked out of my mind. Okay. I don't believe you. <laughs> I came in here hoping that you would tell me the truth. Five hours, dude. This is this is the last ditch. This is what he responds. And this is not the truth, Jody. This is all I know. This is, does not make any sense. I feel Nothing responsible changed. because I feel that I could have done more. I feel that I should have gotten help. I feel that I should have been stronger. You feel responsible because you did this. You did not, Jody. Try you this. did. You did. Uh, and there's nothing you can say that'll change my mind at this point. This is an elaborate story which does not make any sense. I've done this for a long time. It's not even a good, it's a trash this story. This is the most far-fetched story I've ever heard. <laughs> and it's not going to help you. 
Is that how you want to leave this? I just don't want to be here. There is a reason why you did this, and you just refused to tell me about it. Maybe because you are cold and calculated. There's no reason somebody else would come in and do this to him. There's no motive whatsoever. I haven't found any. What is my motive? Jealousy, anger, fear. If you're being alone, angry at him for not keeping you in his life. I don't know. That's why I'm trying to figure it out. There are so many motives with you. Too many. Jody continues to give random details about the fictional assailants for a further eight minutes without being asked. The detective then ends the interrogation. <laughs> one was male, one was female. They were taller than me. Not by a whole lot. Okay. Are you ready to go back? Um, yeah, I guess I'd still like to say something to his family, but... No. I don't think I have anything that could bring them comfort. Okay. Maybe I could write them a letter. Even as the detective is leaving the room, Jody attempts to add further credibility to the new narrative and gives more details of the two attackers. I can give you the so many inconsistencies that I don't even want to deal with right now. Okay, I just don't want okay. my family to get hurt. Okay. They won't get hurt. You're hurting them right now by not telling me the truth. That's what you're doing. Jesus. Okay. Dude, look at her face. Jesus. Detective Blaney comes back with a pen and paper three minutes later. She was curious to see what Jody would write to Travis's family. It ended up being a self-serving and whimsical paragraph about how sorry she was that she couldn't save Travis. The family were never given the letter. <laughs> Jody completely dissects and carefully examines the ham and cheese sandwich before she eats any of it, and as you've probably guessed by now, continues to behave in a rather unusual manner. I don't blow the food, man. Ah, this okay. is so loud. Are you ready to go? I think so. I guess that's really all I needed. Sorry. Don't roll the tape yet. <laughs> Why was he a good traveling companion? Oh, he was a great traveling companion for many reasons. Um, traveling with Travis was kind of like traveling with your own personal comedian <laughs> and our serenader. Jody not only stuck with her story about the assassination squad, she doubled down and agreed to every media request that came her way. She also stuck with a soft-spoken, sweet-natured, Jesus-loving character that wouldn't hurt spiders, let alone human beings. But she once again fails to realize this fake disposition doesn't match the situation whatsoever. If you were sitting in a squalid jail, wrong- Guys, guys what is the media even, even uh, uh, uh... I don't know. ...fully accused of murder, and as a result, facing life in prison or even the death penalty, I don't know why it would enable this. It's just really weird. Like this. She's trying to come across the as the innocent girl next door, but she just looks like a terrifying lunatic. To know that he was stabbed some 27 times and shot once in the left cheek, who could have done this to him? I don't know. Who do you think killed him? I have no idea. Jody, you're pretty calm sitting here. How are you managing to stay so calm? Through my faith and through the knowledge of my own innocence. That's the only thing. Um, I would the same reason why I'm watching it? Right now. Yeah, yeah, but, 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 but the media has a legitimate obligation, though. They, they, they have to be very extremely responsible with, uh, with what they do or something. Like, uh, I, I, I feel like if this, this went out of control, it, it, it could spread a very, very bad dangerous narrative out there and that that could change some of the moving pieces in this i feel like now if, if i had no really yeah I, I think so answer to god for such a heinous crime jody arias killed travis alexander there is no question about it 
This is Jody's defense team, and what you just saw was the very beginning of their opening statement on the first day of her trial. The date is January 2nd, 2013, exactly four years, six months, and two days after Travis was murdered. The million dollar question One, three, is what would have forced her to do it? They must have figured the assassination story wouldn't go down well with a jury, especially when confronted with the many steps Jody took to get away with the murder. So the narrative has now changed for a third time, and the defense have to come up with a plausible explanation for Jody's trail of deception. The hole she had dug herself into was exceptionally deep, and her- Wait, wait, hold up. I, I wasn't saying I was in chat. Her ...to do it. They must have figured- million dollar question is what would have forced her to do it. They must have figured the assassination story wouldn't go down well with a jury, especially when confronted with the many steps Jody took to get away with the murder. So the narrative has now changed for a third time, and the defense have to come up with a plausible explanation for Jody's trail of deception. The hole she had dug herself into was exceptionally deep, and her attorneys are now crafting the rope to pull her out. No Jody shot. Jody did not always tell the truth about what happened that night. She was scared. Scared about what had happened, and scared about what she had done. She had absolutely no experience with police interrogation before. You don't say. And so no. when they talked to her, she wasn't always truthful. Her fear and her panic about what had happened led her to tell different stories. Throughout this trial, you will learn more about Jody Arias. Although not everyone in Travis's family were devout Mormons, all of them were close. He in particular had a very strong relationship with his sister Tanisha. And as you can probably tell, a picture can say a thousand words. Much more about Jody. You will find that she is an articulate, bright young woman who is a very talented artist and photographer. And so what would have forced her to have to take Travis's life on that That's awful fucked day? up, dude. In order to answer that question, we have to go back to the beginning. The bulk of the defense's opening was to paint Jody as the naive victim and Travis as the calculated villain. Being a temple member and an executive director of prepaid legal, outward what, appearances what again? One, three, two, what? would be very important to Travis. And so while he continued this facade of being a good and virginal Mormon man, he was inwardly dealing with his own sexual issues. And in Jody, in Jody, he found somebody Jesus. who was easily manipulated and controlled. Someone who would provide him with that secretive sexual relationship that he needed. They also mentioned that Travis was violent with Jody on several occasions, that he would fly into these sudden rages for almost no reason, and that Jody was terrified of him. They end their statement with Jody's latest account of how Travis was killed. Wait, wait, wait. Which is but before anybody gets mad chat, guys, I don't think we have any knowledge of how um, how lawyers work. and uh, Guys, somebody's end up having to defend it because it's literally, it's literally the job, right? I mean, there's... I, I don't even know how this shit works. I don't, know how, I, don't know, I don't know how it works. I have no idea. Like, somebody has to do their job and have to be good at it, and, like, f I mean, fuck, it, it was... Now a case of justifiable self-defense. The Don't show this part, why not? Um... Okay, what, what, what did I skip? 132... to 134. 132.16 to 132.16, okay. Turney gets to the moment Jody was taking pictures of Travis in the shower. Jody accidentally drops Travis's camera. And as that camera was falling, that was enough for Travis. Because he lunged at Jody in anger, knocking her to the ground in the bathroom where there was a struggle. Jody's life was in danger. In just under a minute from this, in just a minute from this picture, Ooh. we go to the next picture where it's Travis's body, he's clearly injured already, in a minute. Now that very brief moment of time, a minute, they show the family is crying. not the result of premeditation. In that one After minute, had picture. Jody not been forced to defend herself, none of us would be here. That's it? In that one minute, had Jody not chosen to defend herself, she would not be here. 
This is not a case of who done it. The person who done it, the person who committed this killing, sits in court today. It's the defendant, Jody Ann Arias. And the person that she done it to is an individual by the name of Travis Victor Alexander, a former boyfriend of hers, an individual that she was in love with, an individual that was a good man, an individual that was one of the greatest blessings in her life. And this love, well, she rewarded that love for Travis Victor Alexander by sticking a knife in his chest. And you know, he was a good man, according to her. And with regard to being a good man, well, she slit his throat as a reward for being a good man. Jesus. And in terms of these blessings, well, she knocked the blessings out of him by putting a bullet in his head. She took the knife and began to stab him when he was in that defenseless sitting position. This is ah! very... There was where? When? 134 the what? One thirty three five five to one thirty four twenty seven. Important to take note of the prosecution just referred to this, the last photograph of uh, Travis alive. It in the bathroom. Their argument is that Jody either asked him to sit down or at least waited for him to sit down before she began her attack. She knew Travis had to be in a disadvantaged position before she commenced her assault. And the prosecution's argument is that it was at this moment when Travis received a stab wound to the heart. He would have then began to rapidly lose consciousness from that point Good forward. Now? He attempted to protect himself and escape, but he was soon overwhelmed by his attacker due to the rapid blood loss. The pool of blood outside oh. his bathroom reinforces the argument that his throat was cut after the stabbings. And a coroner's report, which will be revealed in more detail later on, concludes that Travis was in all likelihood... Okay. All the way to 24 is 27. That's what I did. That was, it wasn't good enough, but that's right. ...shot in the head last. Jody's version, on the other hand, has to be that Travis was Good shot enough. first. The reason for this will also be explained Good later enough. on. And began and stuck the knife in his chest. He struggled. He grabbed the knife. And when he grabbed the knife, of course that resulted in more blood. I pushed the girl who was there. And I was able to get the better her. And I was about to run out. Get out and go get some help. Except that I was then confronted by the guy. This guy started looking through my purse. And lo and behold, in my purse, believe it or not, I happen to have my car registration that shows my address, because that's what I carry around. So they knew, they being the, this, this guy, knew exactly where I lived. And he said to me, well, if you tell what happened here, the same thing's going to happen to your family. There's a different story now. Now, it's not that she wasn't there. Now, it's not that it's two people with whatever variation she may have provided to these national shows. Now, she admits it. It was her. She's the person who actually did this. And even though she says that, she still has a view as to the evidence. And this is exhibit number 248. Oh. Ah! No jury is going to convict me. Why not? Because I'm innocent, and you can mark my words on that one. No jury will convict me. I also ask that ah! you mark her words while you're marking the guilty verdict for her premeditated killing. Of Travis Alexander. Wow, that's so Jody cringe. spent 18 days on the stand. When she knew what questions were coming, and when completely uncontested, she was very much in her element. She was able to respond to the questions instinctively, and her dialogue came out in a confident and natural manner. You could tell she had each and every one of her responses planned to a T, and had considerable faith that her manipulative prowess would ultimately save her. I don't know why, but they were Spider-Man and... At this point in the trial, the defense had already detailed how Travis was physically abusive, sexually overbearing, and a deep-seated pedophile. Guys, Jody... guys, guys, all this is all staged, right? The, the the lawyers choose and they tailor with the with the jury, whatever, what, how she needs to be portrayed, and, and they train them stated to Stated that go she on caught stage, him on right? his computer looking at images of children, and that Travis had even asked her to wear Spider-Man underwear during sex. The next segment is Jody's supposed theory as to why Travis had such a request. <laughs> I, I do know, however, that prior, the year prior, he... 
there was a child he was close with that really liked Spider-Man. I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but he was very much into Spider-Man. This is the reason why what? she never left Travis after finding out about his pedophilic urges. Um, I was under the impression that when he was able to sleep with a woman, as opposed to fantasizing about a child, he felt what like the more fuck? normal as a, as a man. So, also I had seen prior to this incident many beautiful qualities about him and good qualities about him and things that were attractive about him. And I believe that this incident was how can they do this? A part of himself that he didn't want to foster or that he was fighting or struggling against and that he ultimately wanted to eradicate. So just to clarify what she actually said, her understanding and supportive nature was the reason she stayed in a relationship with an unashamed pedophile. She kept it a complete secret hoping he would change, all the while he was being physically and emotionally abusive on a regular basis. She's tearing down his character, but trying to do so in a subtle manner. She gives off the impression that she's holding back on his detraction to preserve some of his reputation, when she's actually trying to destroy it as much as she guys, possibly guys, can. Guys, guys, this is I, I, I actually, I, I have to ask the chat. Guys, any law Andy's in the chat, well, how, do, how is that dynamic? Your, your lawyer, like, you're brought with this case and you have to present it, and, yet, and you have to argue it, but you don't want to necessarily agree with it, but somebody else is going to take it. Or whatever, right? And you have, you, you, you have to destroy somebody's character and somebody's life in front of their own parents or whatever. Even though you kind of know it's a lie or you absolutely know 100%. And, uh, what, what is that about? Because obviously somebody's going to defend her. Uh, she, no shot, nobody's going to take the case. It's part of the job. But do people create disdain and hate the lawyers who do defend them or just, who are just doing their job? I mean, on... I, I, I dude. Jody's version of events that led up to the killing in her own words. It's important to note that when you rehearse something in your head repeatedly, it can be as though it actually happened. And as we know, Jody had nothing but time on her hands for the last four and a half years. The clip will begin at the moment she dropped what Travis's camera. It slipped. It was kind of like the best I could describe it, like when you go to catch a football, but it bounces and you kind of fumble it a little because it. It didn't slip and just drop, it slipped and I tried to catch it and it kind of bounced a little and then fell on the ground and bounced and rolled onto the tile. It fell first on the mat, then it rolled right onto the tile. The mat isn't very big, it's just kind of right outside the shower. At that point, he got very angry. Did they pull the fucking blueprints, yo! And he stepped out of the shower. He lifted me up from the crouch position with enough force that my feet came off the ground momentarily and he body slammed me on the tile. At that point I rolled and I ran down the hallway. I ran into the closet. I slammed the door. I start running. If you are looking at the diagram, it would be on the left side of the seat. I began running that way with my initial intent to probably run out this door. I instead went for the gun. According to Jody, a gun was hidden above the shelves in Travis's closet. She had discovered it a month earlier while cleaning. I grabbed the gun. Right, as, I don't, right about then, Travis was opening the door. I grabbed it. I ran out into the bathroom. He ran, I believe, straight toward the door as well. At that point, I had run out of the bathroom, and I turned, and I just wanted him to stop, so I pointed the gun at him, hoping that that would just make him halt. And it didn't. Instead, he lunged at me right around the time that the gun went off, and I didn't mean for it to go off. This is why her version has to be that Travis was shot first. According to her, it was all an accident. There was no intention to actually kill, and Travis's death was the unintended result of his own senseless aggression. So you might be wondering how she can explain the 27 stab wounds and the laceration to his throat. We got, we fell with a pretty good force down in the corner, near 15, but not quite a, that close. It was kind of near the sink, kind of sort of that area. And he fell kind of on top of me, but to my right. I didn't want him to get on top of me. He was grabbing at my clothes. He was trying to get on top of me. I don't know where the gun went at that point. It was not in my hands anymore. If it got knocked out of my hands or if I dropped it, what? I broke away what? from him. Eh? Did what? Not in my hands anymore. If it got knocked out of my hands or if I dropped it, what? No, no. Why well, this is a, this is the crucial information. This is, this is very important. This is, this is like the the, the culmination of the story. 
She doesn't know what happened with the gun. D dropped it, not got knocked out. What? And then she says, what? She, I broke she, away. She said, what? From him. And as soon as I broke, the moment I broke away, that's when he threatened my life. Just to be clear on what Jody is talking about, after she accidentally shot Travis in the head, what? he wrestled her to the floor. But she then managed to break away, at which point he screamed the words, I'll fucking kill you, bitch. I'd have no clear memories after that at all. It's things began to get really foggy after the gun went off. So there it is, her explanation as to why she slit the throat and continued stabbing the man she had no intention of killing is that she can't remember. The trauma of the situation caused complete memory loss, but she's able to detail how terrified she was right before her recollection goes blank. It's hard to describe the fear. Um, it was it was like mortal terror, it really was. Um, when he was trying to get on top of me, I thought he was, and then he threatened my life, I really thought he was had intentions to kill me. So. I don't remember spe any specifics of what happened right after that point. This is her explanation as to why she never called the police once she came to her senses, uh. and also why she went to such lengths in order to cover up her involvement. I didn't want people to know the kinds of things that were going on in our relationship. I felt that if I told police Travis attacked me, I would have to give explanation as to why he attacked me. And if I gave explanation as to why, I would have to go back through the different incidents that we'd gone through. What? And how those things didn't really begin until after I walked in on him. I believe they were related, and I didn't. That makes ever want to no go there. sense. So it was all convoluted, and I thought that by Wait, saying that, she's saying that she was traumatized enough that that if she had to explain, she she would be asked questions that would then bring up the memory of the trauma and would trigger her, which which. Uh, that that would open the door to that, to that, to that. And I didn't want to de-edify him. So just to abbreviate what she said, it was all to protect Travis's reputation. She asserts that she was so upset by the event that she became suicidal, and would detail four different occurrences in which she tried, but ultimately failed to kill herself. The first attempt was intended to be by self-inflicted gunshot, and Jody connects it to the registered gun police found in her bedroom after the arrest. I was going to wait until I left Wairika and got to the Salinas or Monterey area so that it didn't happen right in my family's own backyard, so to speak. Um, and I was leaving for that area the morning I was arrested, actually. Her other attempts supposedly happened when she was in jail. I had written out all my suicide letters. I sent my note, I sent them all in an envelope to my grandmother's. Do not open until November 10th, 2008. I was hoping to be dead by then. I was like giving myself a little time to get my affairs in order. I had asked for extra laundry so what? I could stuff it around my body because there was somebody sleeping below me and I didn't want anything to like, I didn't want anything to get on her. So I stuffed it around my body and got under my blankets with my razor. I never did it, obviously. I'm still here, but I was getting comfortable and I was really pissed at myself because I wanted to just, I just wanted to be done. The final strategy from the defense is to portray self-blame from the defendant. It's a subtle ploy to make it seem as though she's not even trying to appear innocent and thus give credibility to everything she had stated up to this point. Have you forgiven yourself for not finding another way out of the situation you found yourself in on June 4th? No, I think that If I had just left before this, this question was and kind that of... happened, I have a million regrets. I mean, I, I was scared of him and I reacted, but I still, re I will always regret everything about that. Do you blame yourself for not taking some other alternative measures? Yes. I think maybe if I had handled the gun properly and just, I meant to just point it at him. I thought it would stop him. And maybe he wouldn't have gotten as angry as he did. Maybe he wouldn't have threatened to kill me. I don't know. Well, I mean, leaving, it's, it's her own lawyer, I think. I, I think this is the prosecution. This is her lawyer. Remember they showed her? Ma'am, do you remember having a conversation with Detective uh, Flores of the Mesa Police Department back on is July 15th of uh, 2008? Yes. And this was the day that you were arrested, right? Yes. 
What's oh, fascinating about sorry. this prosecutor's approach is that the vast majority of his cross-examination doesn't even challenge Jody's new storyline. He simply asks specific questions within it. He puts a microscope under certain elements and lets the absurdity of it all speak for itself. And during that time, you told him something, and let's take a look at it uh, right now. Okay. I think you can help us. I would love to help you in any way that I can. Okay. That's not true, is it? Um, I don't know. I guess it depends on what help means. Yes or no? Were you there to help him? I don't know. Were you there to tell the truth? No. That wasn't the truth, was it? That you were there to help him, was it? No, that was not the truth. You'll notice that Jody has a hard time agreeing to details that actually conform to her own narrative. The tone of the prosecutor puts her on the defensive, and she tries her best to avoid agreeing with what he's saying, even though the actual context of his dialogue correlates with her own defense. So, and, right? in fact, you were there for a different purpose. You were there so that he wouldn't get the truth, right? No, I was there against my will. There's nothing that the detective ever did to get you to say whatever it was that you said on the first interview, right? Answer well. Not that I recall. Well, again, we're with the memory issue. Ma'am, are you having problems remembering what happened back on July 15th of 2008? No. So he didn't do anything then, right? Anything what? What are we talking about, ma'am? Are you again having problems understanding yeah, what's going on? Your Honor, if she can't understand his questions, that's... Overall, to me, answer. I don't understand his question. Ma'am, the detective didn't do anything during the interview to cause you to lie, right? No. So with this interview, you then started to talk about whether or not you had been in Arizona, right? Yes. You said no, you hadn't been in Arizona, right? That's right. That's an absolute lie, right? Yes. And the reason that, that you didn't want to admit to being in Arizona is because you knew that you had killed Travis Alexander, right? Yes. Ma'am, after that interview, you then had another chance to have a conversation huh? with Detective Flores the next day, right? Yes. And huh? Is because you knew that you had killed Travis Alexander, right? Yes. Ma'am, after that interview, you then Oh, go to the story, it can make sense, yeah. Had another chance to have a conversation with Oh, yeah, it can make sense, the story makes sense, okay. Yes. And again, it was a voluntary conversation, wasn't it? Yes. And okay, I'm it was done. the same situation as the day before, right? He sat down, he asked you questions, right? Yes. That's when you changed your story, didn't you? Yes. Because you did not want any consequences with regard to the killing of Travis Alexander, right? I wasn't concerned about consequences at that point. That wasn't my goal, so. Well, no. was your goal to go to prison? Not a physical prison on earth, no. I was trying to kill myself, I think. Ma'am, you've said that many times, that you tried to kill yourself, right? In court. I don't know that many, but I've recounted a time that I did. You, you, you said it more than three, four, five times, right? Perhaps. It's very interesting to see which questions she tries to avoid, or which statements she outright refuses to concur with. Her suicidal tendencies were such a huge part of her own testimony, yet she just can't bring herself to agree with what was a very straightforward question from the prosecutor. The amount of times she spoke about suicide should be of no concern, unless, of course, she had an agenda behind it. When a specific topic such as this gets brought up, she all of a sudden becomes highly cautious in how she responds. Cross-examination on the actual killing started on day 39. At this moment, Jody has already explained that she dropped the camera, was body slammed by Travis, rolled away, and had just ran into the closet to get the gun. So then you just said that you were going over to the closet area to get the gun, right? The 39? Corner. The corner, right? And as you are in that corner, he's coming in through the door, right? Guys, I'm, I'm confused. Yes. Guys, guys, what about the jury? Did they have to show up to, to, to the court? 39 times? But man, this is a very small closet, isn't no! it? No! No, it's shot. bigger than the cell that I live in. Are they paid for this shit? It's bigger than what? It's bigger than the cell that I live in. It's not a small closet. Ma'am, we don't want to know where you live in. Do you understand that? 
I'm just using that as reference. It's not small. Do you understand? Did I ask you where you were living? No. We're clear, right? We do not want to know where you're living right now. You understand that? Okay, sorry. You run in, into the bathroom. Whoa! Uh, guys, when is uh, when is uh, want to know where you're when, right now. Is, when is the next to TOS, uh, dude? You understand? At that? 157. Okay, sorry. You run in into the bathroom, don't you? Yes. You're in a hurry, right? Yes. You want to get away, right? Um, I want him to not get close to me. Well, you want to get away. That's what's going on, right? I want him to not get near me. That's what's going right. on. No, well, so that what makes you no do sense then at all. is, according to you, is you then go in here, and then you pivot, right? Or turn around. Yes. You have the gun. 151, you sure about that? No, 157 is what he says. Which hand do you have the gun up in? Both. So um, you have it out like this with both hands outstretched? Yes. Correct? Yes. And so you have the gun outstretched and He's still not there yet, right? He's still in the closet. He's coming out the door as I turn. So he's at the door now, right? And according to you, he is on you when you shoot him, right? Not quite on me. I think the, the gun went off and then he impacted me right shortly after that. And in fact, according to your testimony on direct, he falls on top of you, right? He lunges at me like a linebacker. Jody used this linebacker analogy a number of times throughout the trial. The prosecutor now asks her to give a visual example. It appeared to have no real tactical purpose, but it was certainly a welcome and somewhat comical distraction for the viewers at home amid the graphic testimony. Um, as he was running... No, no, just, just show me. That's what I'm asking you to do, not talk. Show me. Show me the linebacker pose. He got down and... Well, show me. Show me the linebacker pose. That's what I'm asking for you to do. Okay. He went like that, and he turned his head and grabbed my waist. Just like that, correct? Pretty much. And he grabbed your waist, right? I can't say it's just like that, but that's what I remember. Well, no, just, just, I want, without talking, just show me the pose. He got down like that? Like that. Yeah. All right, go ahead and have a seat then. After he came at you, ma'am, and he, that happened, did you go down? We both went down. And he's still not dead, right? Definitely not. He's very angry. He's very angry, and this is seconds afterwards, right? Yes. Is he on all fours now? Um, he's on the side of me, grabbing at my clothes and grabbing at me. What happens then? I break away from him, and he screams out, fucking kill you, bitch. And then what do you do? I don't really remember. I just remember... I don't remember anything at that point, so I would be speculating. So you don't remember a single solitary thing after that, right? The prosecutor for the next several hours would argue the improbability of that being the case. The memory loss caused by trauma would put Jody's mind in a state of disorganized chaos. Yet her next steps were highly calculated, as we all know. Even going by her own narrative, she knew exactly where to strike Travis with a knife in order to kill him. Hours. She also cleaned down the crime scene and deleted the photos from Travis's camera. This argument took over three hours to conduct and had to be explained through the scope of mathematics and science. On paper, it was perhaps the most damning part of cross-examination. Guys, guys, what if, you're, if you have a highly paid job and you're like almost like a CEO or some shit and you get called for jury duty to be listening to a jury for fucking 80 days? What the f did you, did you just lose the business? You fucking bankruptcy? Yet it was so complicated that much of the testimony could have been lost with a jury. It was in fact the start of day 44 that had the most impact. It involved the time span between the two photographs taken on Travis's camera by accident. The prosecutor's argument is that Jody would not have enough time to carry out her version of events. He will first get her to recount all of these events in detail, and as she is doing so, will be oblivious to the prosecutor's closing argument. She will begin digging her own grave without realizing it. And it's important to note that all of what she is about to recount occurred in just 62 seconds. This exhibit, 161, is when the camera, according to you, can't actually see, hit the ground. Can't see it. Is it guys, is this camera hitting the ground? Is there gonna be bad stuff in there? Because that, that's not what 1.7. 
That's not toss. This is fine. This is nothing. Right? I don't know if it's hitting the ground as that photo was taken or not. So you don't know how this photograph was taken then, right? It could have been when I was trying to catch it. I don't know. At some point, the camera hits the ground, right? Yes. That's what you told the jury, right? It hits the mat, yes, and rolls to the top. Ma'am, yes or no, didn't you tell the jury that the camera hit the ground near the shower? Yes no, or no? No, I said it landed on the mat. Is that near the shower? Yes. Is the mat on the floor near the shower? Yes. And the camera hitting the mat, would that be near the shower? Yes. And you then said that Mr. Alexander became very upset, right? Yes. Incoming. Uh, guys, my guy says it's fine. 157. And that, that's what started this whole thing out because he sort of stepped out of the shower and then came after you, right? He picked me up. That's coming after you, isn't it? And according to you, those movements culminated or continued when he grabbed you and put you down on the ground, right? Yes. And as a result of that, you said that you bumped your head or hit your head, right? Yes. And that maybe it knocked the wind out of you, right? Yes. And that you were in fear at that point, right? Yes, very much. And that you were able to fight him off so that you could get away, right? Um, I rolled. You roll away and you begin to run down, run down the hallway, right? Yes. And then you went into the closet, right? Correct. According to you, that's where you went and obtained the gun, right? Yes. When you went into the bathroom, you were able to turn around, if you will, and now you had the gun in your hands, right? That's what you told us, right? Yes. And that's when he was coming at you in this linebacker pose, right? Around that time, yes. And that's when you shot him in the face, right? Um, yeah, that's when the gun went off. So then, according to you, he fell on top of you, right? It was kind of on top, but maybe more to the right. I don't know. It wasn't directly on top of me. I was trying to prevent him from getting on top of me. And that's when the memory issue started, correct? <laughs> right? I'd say that. Actually, ma'am, the way you describe that, it's impossible for the killing to have happened in that manner, isn't it? Yes, yeah, you argue that. No. That's just according to you. You'll notice that Jody evades the majority of the questions in this next segment. She starts to realize the argument put forward is making complete sense, and will at all costs avoid saying yes to most of the points laid out for her. It's as though she knows a fundamental part of her storyline is about to be exposed. We know that there's some action that is going on at 531 14. Right? Something's going on, right? Yes. It's nothing. We also know that Exhibit 162. Oh wait, it's 532.16. Bloody right. Good which job. Is a minute and two seconds later, correct? Correct. So you've now shot him. You've told us that the fog is rolling in and that you have no memory. For now. You still don't know where the knife is, do you? I don't remember a lot from that period. For now. It could be. Right, but you told us before that period even that you didn't know where the knife was. Do you remember just telling me that? Uh, today as I sit here, I don't remember where the knife was. On June 4th, I might have remembered where it was. do you remember a cross-examination that I asked you if you knew where the knife was on June 4th? And you said, no, I, I don't remember where the knife was. And so as you shot Mr. Alexander, you by necessity then have to go look for the knife, don't you? I don't know the answer to that. Well, you didn't have the knife in your hand when you shot him. That's, did, did you? The state. Did you have the knife in your hand when you shot him? Same question. That's not argument. No, I did not. So, that means that if you didn't have the knife in your hand, you needed to go get it from somewhere, right? I guess, I don't know. No, 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 there's no guessing here now. Uh, if you didn't have it in your hand and you just shot him and you're rolled away, right? Objection, argument. State. You do then agree that if the knife, if you didn't know where the knife was and Mr. Alexander didn't have it, it would take time for you to go find that knife, wouldn't it? Objection, argument. <clears throat> world. I don't know. I don't know where the knife was. Right. Since you didn't know where the knife was, 
it would take time to go find it, irrespective of where it was, wouldn't it? Um, I guess under that theory. Sure, under that theory. It would take time, right? Yeah, I guess. And what you're telling us, under your scenario, is that in 62 seconds, you get body slammed, you do whatever you do, but you get away, you run down the hallway, you go in the closet, you grab a gun, you back up, you shoot Mr. Alexander, he goes down, he's still pawing at you and saying, fucking kill you, bitch. And then, after you're able to get away, you go get the knife, and he ends up at the end of the hall with all in 62 seconds. That's what you're telling us? No, that's not what I'm saying. And he didn't say fucking kill you, bitch, till I got away. And Pardon? He didn't say fucking kill you, bitch, until after I got away. You said he said it before I broke away, but he said it right as I broke away. She just created a non-argument for the purpose of deflecting from the primary contention. Whether or not Travis said those words before or after she broke away has no bearing whatsoever on the prosecutor's assertion, which he now reiterates. And then you had to go get the knife for everything to occur so that we got here. He's putting a picture on the, on the projector? All the particulars of what's going the on in that picture, picture, so I can't even say if that's true or not. You might be thinking Jody has an argument here, that perhaps Travis was only shot and not stabbed. This would have given reason for the blood, and contend that Jody wouldn't have had to go looking for the knife. But the medical examiner found little to no bleeding at the site of the bullet track. The probable reason for this is that Travis was already dead. But there are also medical phenomena that could still prove Jody's narrative to be true. What she can't prove, however, is that this blood came from the gunshot. You say that he gets shot, right? That's correct. Goes down. Smart. And you describe for us that Is it good now? He's One thirteen. at you, and then you're able to sort of. We're good now. Stand up. That was smart, kill though. You bitch. And then the fog rolls in, right? No, then I have no memory. The fog was already there. The fog was already there, and. Did you or did you not have the knife with you? The memory loss, dude, come on. And you obtained it at some other point when you can't tell us, right? Uh, it would appear that way, yes. You say it would appear that way. Let's be clear, there wasn't anybody else there, right? That's correct. And you did stand up at some point. You remember telling us that, right? I believe I did. And when you stood up, he was still on the ground, right? I don't recall looking back. Pardon? I don't recall looking back. So you were, even though he's still a threat to you, according to you, and he's just threatened your life, you turn your back on the threat? Yeah, I'm trying to get away. This was the time she stated verbatim, the fog was already there. Yet when she feels threatened by a question, she all of a sudden has a vivid recollection. The element of the time span between the two photographs goes on for another 45 minutes. Yet the full context of the argument had already been asserted Jesus. by this point, and perhaps strengthened by Jody's defensive posture throughout the entire exchange. When a battered woman is attacked, and they're defending their life, they don't know when to stop. Travis Alexander's body was stabbed 27 times. It may be that Jody Arias didn't know when to stop. Wait, that's the, all right, that's the, that's this, the uh, individual, the defendant, Jody Ann Arias. That's the closing argument? Travis Alexander. And even after stabbing him over and over again, and even after slashing his throat from ear to ear, and then even after taking a gun and shooting him in the face, she will not let him rest in peace. But now, instead of a gun, instead of a knife, she uses lies. This is an individual who is manipulative. This is an individual who will stop at nothing and will continue to be manipulative and will lie at every turn and at every occasion that she has. Everything in this case points to the fact that it did not happen. There are no medical reports, there are no friends, there is no one that can come in and say anything about that. 
There are no medical records. There is absolutely nothing. There is a direct strike to his neck, which is an indication of somebody who is thinking Jesus. this person's not going to live. He may get away from me in the shower. He may get away from me all the way to the sink. And he may stumble his way down that hallway. But you know, I caught him. And now, rather than stabbing him anywhere else, right here. So it's a very well orchestrated kill. The other thing that she did is that she created a lie that really involves behavior that is a hot button kind of topic. How horrific it is to be accused falsely of being a pedophile. He's not here. He's not here to say, no, that's not true. And so State goes to the computer and doesn't find anything there. Oh, no, no, I changed my mind. It was actually images. First of all, her journal indicates that there wasn't such an event. Second of all, the text messages also indicate the same thing. And what human being, if that is the allegation, if they really are caring, what human being doesn't go to the police and say, or somebody else, this person is a pedophile? What she does, well, it's the new approach. It's the new approach to pedophilia. What does she do? Well, let's jump in the sack. That's what we're going to do. The State of Arizona versus Jody Ann Arias, verdict count one. We, the jury, duly impaneled and sworn, and the above entitled action upon our oaths do find the defendant as to count one, first degree murder, guilty. Five jurors find premeditated, zero find felony murder, seven find both premeditated and felony. Um, just a couple of minutes ago, you heard the verdict from the jury. What are your thoughts? Um, I think I just went blank. Huh? Just, um... I don't know. I just feel overwhelmed. I think I just need to... They're going to jail, Dad! Take it a day at a time. You How about a year at a time? How about, how about a decade? Did you family while you were in there? Or did you make eye contact? And what are your thoughts on that? Um, I typically... Let's we'll do it a decade at a time. How about that? Travis comes from a family where they all sort of look a lot alike. So when I see their faces, I see Travis. And I see the man that abused me. And I don't want to look at that. Well, the worst outcome for me would uh. be natural life. I would much rather die a lot sooner than later. Longevity runs in my family, and I don't want to spend the rest of my natural life in one place. So you're saying you actually prefer getting the death penalty to being in prison for life? Yes. Jody changed her mind about wanting to die. Again, during her plea to save her life, she was sure to mention all the charitable work she decided to take part in after being charged with first-degree murder. A few months before trial, and by that I mean jury selection, my hair was past my waist, and I donated it. Additionally, I've designed a t-shirt. <laughs> no shot! This is the t-shirt. Um, of which 100% of the proceeds go to support nonprofit organizations which also assist other victims of domestic uh, violence. Who bought that? Who? Huh? What? This is the t-shirt. When did you do that? Um, of which 100% of the proceeds go to support nonprofit organizations which also assist other victims of domestic violence. We can never get him back. We are so grateful for our wonderful brother, and we feel so lucky and blessed for the time we had with Travis, however short-lived. Christ. We would get anything to have him back. Anything. <laughs> Thank you. The right thing, the difficult thing, 
in this case, and it, because it's never easy. Her duty, the difficult thing to do under these circumstances, the only thing that you can do based on the mitigating circumstances and their lack of, is to return a verdict of death. The simple question that's before you is do you kill her? That's the question. Oh, come she on. She has done something very bad. She did. And you have convicted her for that. You have told her that she is guilty of first degree murder for that. Chat. But the question is now. Hey guys, isn't ah, uh, dude, got, got, uh, I don't know much about law, but isn't it? Is this? It should be. I think this shouldn't be like some sort of like weird like forbidden jutsu or some shit. To to say, to put put the jury in a position where oh, that will make that you kill. Now you're a killer. That's oh man, why? Do you kill her? State of Arizona versus Jody Ann Arias sentencing verdict. No, but I can the No, but even then. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. Guys, I, this, this is in the, guys, this is nothing, nothing to do with my belief about death penalty. I don't even have a belief. I never really thought about it. I think that in a state where it is, you know, according to the law and whatever, according to the whatever. Upon our oaths, unanimous, unanimously find, having considered all of the facts and circumstances, that the defendant should be sentenced. No unanimous, you know, no unanimous uh, agreement. Signed for a person. Nobody cares. I care. Is this your true verdict? So say you want to know? Yes. It is ordered the defendant shall be incarcerated in the Department of Corrections for the rest of her natural life with no possibility of parole. Jody Arias is currently housed at the Arizona State Prison Complex. She maintains her innocence to this day. Oh. And then, uncomfortable with her handcuff situation, she then gets up off the chair, which I don't know if any of the people... Guys, what is a true crime loser? What is that? People that I've done yet have done anything like this. She gets off the chair and then sits on the floor. And at one point on the floor, she's like like this. And then she whoo, like whips her hair way back. And when she did that, I was like, ha! Ah! She just is a horrifying, just the way she moves. Oh, it's I think I said that in the other one. So she's sitting there and then this woman... I don't know, detective or something comes in, it kind of like, is like, what are you doing on the floor? Okay. Well, that was interesting. Okay. Well, Jesus Christ. Give me a little 